So I'm going to talk about dorsal root ganglion stimulation. We'll wait a second till the uh, slides come up. Um, for those of you who didn't know, I mentioned it already. Spinal Modulation was the company that started uh, with this technology. The idea came from an, a wondering and an understanding of how the DRG works and may be a target for neurostimulation. So these researchers started putting small little electrodes about the thickness of a capellini as compared to spaghetti, which is what I like to call spinal cord stimulator leads. And they started putting it out over the DRG. And what they started to see was it actually worked. Um, and they developed a technology further in the Bay Area. Then the trials were done over in Europe. And uh, St. Jude Medical purchased spinal modulation, and now it's Abbott. So we're going to go through uh, the technique here in the next 20, 25 minutes. Um, as I mentioned already, I do receive honorary with Abbott, which is the company that makes this. So indications for dorsal root ganglion simulation, there is some overlap, as we already talked about. We talked about complex regional pain syndrome. Um, can someone tell me what causalgia is? What is that? Anyone? Re don't be shy. What is causalgia? OK. OK, so there's nerve injury and there's algia, pain. Yeah. So uh, pain after a nerve injury. And why I bring it up is, as many of you know, the term complex regional pain syndrome has gone through an evolution in the last 160 years since the time of the Civil War. and. Causalgia you know, is typically referred to these days as CRPS type 2. But we should remember that causalgia is simply, as stated, uh, pain after a nerve injury. So there's been a lot of confusion when it comes to the definitions and the indications for dorsal root ganglion stimulation. Um, but I consider causalgia, as we just talked about, pain after nerve injury. So it could include complex regional pain syndrome, which should be diagnosed based on the Budapest criteria, um, as well as persistent post-surgical pain syndromes which may not have the pseudomotor, vasomotor uh, components to the nerve injury, uh, but causalgia really encompasses both. And then you have peripheral neuropathy, which is something we've already seen some significant results with, uh, but we're uh, currently in the midst of trials for looking at DRG for certain peripheral neuropathic pain syndromes. It should be noted that only providers who have completed the 14 hours of training with Abbott on the techniques and practice of DRG simulation may perform it. Just because you will see it and learn it today doesn't mean you can go home and do it. Um, but if you are becoming more proficient with stimulation and do want to go through the training, uh, that's certainly something that can happen down the road. What was sort of interesting, why this all developed, was um, I'm kind of smiling because I know exactly who did this. Uh, there was an individual who, when he was consulting with spinal modulation, really wanted to ensure that all neurostimulation was really done with the highest degree of education and training before we actually went through with it so that we could reduce the associated with complications. And so he suggested having mandatory training uh, with DRG stimulation. Uh, he was just making a suggestion, but the FDA turned it around and said, you know what, that's a good idea. We're going to make uh, the company pay for all the training, and everybody has to go through this training. Um, so that is what it is. I think it's really uh, been a great thing, because I think the individuals who are doing it uh, are very scrupulous in who they're choosing to do this for, and their techniques are far, I think, uh, better than if they did not have that training. Because this could potentially be a very dangerous procedure. It is far more technically advanced than your run-of-the-mill spinal cord simulator uh, procedure, which you know I can do a trial in 15, 20 minutes. A DRG simulator trial can take 10 minutes. It can also take two hours, depending on one's anatomy and the levels, et cetera. It is fairly new. It was FDA approved in February 2016. And the on-label use is for T10 and below. I will show you some off-label stuff uh, in some of our cases. So a reminder of the anatomy, the dorsal root ganglia, are these bulbous structures here and here. Uh, they are really the gatekeeper to your sensory or afferent information coming to your spinal cord. Uh, that is where the cell bodies to those peripheral neurons are housed. And one of the current theories for how DRG stimulation works 
is that by applying an electrical field to that structure, you change the filtering of nociceptive input through the DRG up to the dorsal horn and up the spinal thalamic tract. Um, the way we're able to access the DRG is, as you may recall, the epidural space does peter out along the dorsal root ganglion. So these Quinn Hogan uh, cryomicrotome sections do a very nice job illustrating that epidural space both uh, dorsally and ventrally but also showing you how they peter out across laterally to the DRG. So we take advantage of the epidural space. Really, I, in my opinion, it was a space invented for us. Um, and we use that to place our contacts or electrodes or leads. <clears throat> One of the things that you will encounter um, that you never would have learned from your medical school anatomy is that there are all these neuroforaminal ligaments which can make the passage of your sheath system and lead a little bit more challenging. Uh, and so why this, I bring this up is clinically, as you're doing these trials, there will be a bit of resistance as you exit the foramen, and then you'll feel a loss. That moment of stimulation where you're pushing on these ligaments can be painful for your patients. You just want to warn them about it. Use your verbal anesthesia. Do not anesthetize or you know, give more propofol or whatever. So just warn your patients about this, really important. As you can see, as you're trying to push out a lead, which in comparison to this nerve is probably about this in diameter, you're really gonna put a lot of pressure on that nerve root and patients can, can sense it. So radiographically, what you're trying to do is send your, your lead out underneath the pedicle, really hug the inferior aspect of the pedicle. We've highlighted where, that lo where those locations are. As you move down the spine, the DRG uh, location ends up being a bit more lateral. So when we talk about the L4, L5 uh, DRG placements, we actually want a more lateral placement than what you see here. These are some of the first leads that were placed. This is in 2011. Uh, I'll show you some slides where we're putting uh, the L5 and L4 leads a little bit more laterally because the DRGs are just a bit more lateral. And I tried to highlight that with these circles, whereas as you go from L3 and up, it's directly under the pedicle. So that should be your goal. Um, I actually wanted uh, the reps to bring in some hardware. I want you guys grab one of the Abbott reps to see if they could bring some hardware we could pass around. Thanks. So a little overview of uh, the stuff you have in your hand. It's very different than what you have with um, your spinal cord simulator systems. Uh, the two differences are, one, you have uh, a sheath. You have both a shallow curve and a deep curve sheath. As you can see here, these are these brown uh, objects here. They have an injection port, um, which you may choose to use uh, to inject things like saline if you need to break up some epidural adhesions. Um, I generally try not to use local, um, but there are some individuals out there who do. The port is very important because it, it, it reminds you of your orientation of the curve. So the injection port is lined up with the curve. So you'll see it rotate as you, as you move forward. The second component is um, a fine stylet to your lead, which is right here. Uh, these are actually the older leads from spinal modulation. They have a ball tip, which you do not see, hey man, uh, which you do not see currently. We're gonna pass around uh, the whole system so you have a good feel for it. It's one of those things you really want to feel, play with, and sort of, um, take it to its limits to understand what those limits are. So when we do the procedure, we'll do it in our cadavers this afternoon. Um, instead of just having your two e your leads and you're just driving like you have with spinal cord stimulation, you have to understand how to, your needle position has to be a certain orientation, your sheath has to be a certain way, your lead and your stylet has to be a certain way. And you're going to be making adjustments with basically three to four of those systems in order to drive the lead to exactly where you want it to go. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of walk through how we do that. Um, the positioning is uh, for DRG simulation is no different uh, than spinal cord stimulation. You really want to remove that lumbar lordosis. Um, you want your patients to be comfortable. Um, and then, uh, yeah, take it from there. We'll talk about that as we are in the labs as well. So our needle trajectories are a little bit different. Um, I don't like to be very dogmatic about, oh, go one and a half vertebral levels or two pedicles or, or however 
uh, you want to say it. I try to find the pedicle that is my target, DRG. Then I find that interlaminar space. And I find a point about one third the distance between the spinous processes as long as my end plates are lined up. And then I take a radio opaque straight edge and I line right from that pedicle through that midpoint. And where I begin, if I choose, I usually choose this purple trajectory, not the red. I, I generally am a little bit more lateral to get out over the pedicle. But where I begin, it could be here, could be here, depends on how much subcutaneous tissue your patient has, right? So if you have someone who has a BMI of 40, I'm probably starting out here and asking my rep for a six inch needle. Uh, whereas if I have a 86 year old like I had last week, whose BMI was about 20, you know, I can start a little bit closer, okay? Um, and the same could be true with spinal cord stimulation, understanding where you begin, but really draw, mark up, uh, and understand your patient's anatomy, especially as you're starting out, um, because the more you, you incorporate that into your knowledge and practice now, the better off you're going to be. It's going to avoid errors down the road, because you're going to start to see patients with significant scoliosis, with tons of hardware, and then you're going to start to understand how can I make modifications to my technique to deal with those issues rather than just going in and saying, I'm just going to go two vertebral levels and then I'm in. For the L4 and L5 uh, DRGs, as we mentioned, the technique is a little bit different. Um, we're coming in a little bit more laterally or shallow uh, in order to get out under the pedicle. And part of that is because, because of the width between the pedicles of L4 and 5 at, compared to going from L3 and up. But also, as I mentioned, you're really going to try to find those DRGs a little bit more lateral uh, than you would at the other levels. Um, some people have been teaching, oh, just find the PSIS or, or come lateral to the S2 neuroforamina. Don't do that necessarily. Um, I just, again, take that radio opaque marker, look for my target pedicle, find my ideal needle entry location, which they have a little bit off midline here. I still tend to be a little bit closer to midline and then come in. And we'll talk all about that when we're in the lab here. So needle position, in my opinion, is even more important for DRG simulation than it is for spinal cord simulation. I think you have a lot more leeway, in fact. When you're starting out, you're going to feel like it's very strict with SES. It's even more strict with DRG. Because it's not about just entering the epidural space. It's about exactly where you enter the epidural space. You must enter around midline uh, if you're too far lateral, you're not going to be able to overcome the DRG with your sheath, or excuse me, the, the, the dorsal aspect of the dura uh, with your sheath. If you're too lateral, uh, then you make your trajectory maybe too off where you're going to start to see your DRG contacts too ventral, which I'll show you with some laterals here. So here are just some uh, models of what we deal with. So you have your lead, which will be inside that brown sheath, which is being passed around. And inside the lead, the lead itself, you have a stylet. You have the ability to screw uh, the lead into a locked position and then to unlock it. Uh, some people choose not to lock ever and just hold pressure on the lead. Uh, I don't do that because I don't like bending the lead more than I need to. So I do use the lock mechanism. As you can see here, what they do then is they get the TUI. Um, sometimes I do use a curved TUI, and I'll show you some images of that. Uh, as Dr. Stacy was mentioning. Um, so you get your, your general 14-gauge TUI. You have a sheath now that has a curve. And so you're really trying to bounce it, basically, off of the pedicle and out along the DRG. Okay. Now, one of the things I'll mention when we're in the lab is you don't want your injection port to be downward facing or too far lateral or else that lead is going to start to wrap too far ventrally. And you'll see motor stimulation, which is exactly what you want to avoid. Remember, you want to remain dorsal because you want to affect the sensory or afferent aspect. So what we then do is we, we have our, our lead, which is in the sheet system. We hold the lead in place, and we pull the sheet back. Okay, So it's kind of a super advanced cellular technique. Okay, So we bring the sheet back to the needle. And now our goal next is to then create redundancy in the lead so that you have tension relief loop within the epidural space. All right, so here we go. We're now unlocking. We're pulling back, back the sheath. 
the chewy remains in place, uh, and the lead is remaining in place. So again, you're, you have to, when you're starting out, it is a lot to think about, and it seems overwhelming. But as you'll see over time, it becomes an art form, and you just start understanding how each one of these things works. So the lead is staying out there. Uh, the sheath is coming back. You're bringing it within the needle. And here's the fluoro image, where now, uh, when you bring th this radiopaque mark here is the tip of the sheath. What you see here are the contacts of the lead. And in order to make that nice large loop cephalad, you have to take out the stylet from the lead. So you lose the, the rigidity of the lead. So now it's a cooked beyond al dente capellini. And so it's loosey-goosey. You bring it back, the, the stylet. You bring back the sheet. Now you advance the lead. And the lead should advance cephalad. As we all know, there can be adhesion. There can be scar tissue. So sometimes you can't. Sometimes it won't advance cephalad. So sometimes you'll need to make a tension relief loop that heads caudally. Um, and I have some images, which I'll show you in just a bit about that. So if we look at sort of the one, two, three uh, steps of how, what we're doing here, again, first we're initially getting that nice, large cephalad loop. As you can see, the contacts are basically hugging underneath that pedicle. And then what we're going to do is we're going to reorient so we create this tension relief loop. So now the sheath and the needle are facing all the way to the right. And you can see the radiopaque tip of the sheath. Now we're advancing that lead. It's making that nice bow. I'm bringing back the sheath further into the needle. And now I'm flipping everything to the left. And now I'm advancing lead to the left. And I've created this nice large S curve. So now when that patient uh, does all the BLT, the bending, lifting, and twisting, you, not, you have this nice tension relief curvature where those contacts are really going to stay in place. And what's really interesting is um, one of my patients had an infection, unfortunately, and I had to remove everything. And when I pulled out uh, all the leads, they follow that track. It creates a nice epidural tunnel, uh, if you will, where that lead remains right in place. So you can really actually have almost uh, no activity restrictions. I'm, I'm not supposed to say that, but we've had some individuals where I've really let them uh, do a lot more activity than I would with spinal cord stimulation, and there hasn't been any issue with migration. Because once you have all this redundancy within the epidural space, as opposed to an anchor point and tension relief loops in paraspinal muscle or in the IPG with spinal cord stimulation, uh, your risk of migration is actually reduced. Now, migration can happen, but that's only if your lead is uh, improperly placed, i.e., you have a crossover loop where the lead wants to sag down, or you're not lateral enough where the ligaments are really holding on to the leads. That's where you will see migration. So it's super important to have good technique starting out. When we take a lateral, what we want to see and we want to make sure of, this is extremely important, is that your contacts never cross the posterior border of the vertebral bodies. Okay, So they should be coming out and looking at you. And you can see how these are Cheerios or O's. That's a good sign. That means those contacts are looking directly out at you. Um, so that tells you that those third and fourth contacts are um, moving perfectly lateral. All right, so here's some of my own personal images. This is a, a situation where I really tried and struggled to get cephalad spread of that tension relief loop. So I really I took it laterally and then created a nice caudal loop. As you can see here, we really try to aim to get the second and third contacts underneath the pedicle. Uh, if there's some shift, that's OK. That's why you have the redundancy with having four contacts. Um, but this is, you know, people will talk about this as the large omega loop, which is totally fine. You don't always have to have the S, as you can see here. Um, and this was bilateral. You can see here on the lateral image, I use that large curved TUI, and you can see all my contacts are basically nothing is nothing is anterior to this posterior vertebral border. Everything is staying within the neural foramen. Here's another uh, image. It's a little bit dark, uh, but this was a T4 placement. As you can see, um, large omega loop here, uh, needles placed, aiming for that pedicle, and then in the lateral, you can see we have nice. Uh, posterior placement. And you can, you can use it for sacral uh, DRGs as well, which has been super interesting. Uh, 
this is a patient I, I think we'll talk about later who had vulvodynia. Um, and so we have nice, uh, the DRGs of, of the sacral nerve roots are quite variable, um, but they can be anywhere from within uh, the sacral plate to uh, anterior to it. But we're seeing great results for uh, not only peripheral neuropathy of like S1, but we're seeing it for, I'm using it for penile pain, testicular pain, vulvodynia, and chronic pain, pelvic pain syndromes. All right, so the literature um, is growing. Again, this is a fairly new technology. Uh, so we had sort of the, the pilot uh, studies from 2013, which demonstrated efficacy. Um, Jeff Kramer, who's now moved on from Abbott, looked at the positional effects, because one of the interesting things about the DRG is that that volume of CSF I was talking to you about before that you have when you, when you have a midline placement in the epidural space is pretty thick. But as you move out laterally to the DRG, there's almost no CSF, right? It's very, very fine amount. And so your resistivity is far less. And therefore, the power consumption for DRG stimulation is on the order of 100 to 1,000 times less than what you'd need with spinal cord stimulation. Um, we now have the subset analysis from Accurate, which found that DRG was superior to SCS for CRPS, as we just talked about a little bit ago. And right now, they're doing post-market studies for DRG stimulation for all of the conditions from T10 and below. And we're enrolling for uh, peripheral neuropathy now. So you'll see more and more studies coming out with DRG stimulation. It's still young, it's still early, um, but it's been pretty exciting. I'll talk a lot about it in our case studies, but for me, it's been the most fun thing to do over the last year. <laughs>